All right, let's get started. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for spending your time with me today and sharing your, your knowledge with my students. Um, as I told you, and we talked a little bit, this is a introduction to social justice course. And the students have already learned a little bit about socialization, about um, prejudice and discrimination, about power and oppression. So we're just kind of touching base um, a little bit on each topic. And what I'm hoping to do today is to provide the students with real life examples of folks that are living social justice and incorporating into their work. So go ahead and take it away and feel free to introduce yourself and a little bit about you. Okay, so my name is Maribel Galvan. I currently live in Kent, Washington. That's the state of Washington, uh, Washington, DC. Um, but I'm originally from East Los Angeles. Our family came up here in the late 90s, um, but all our extended family is still in LA. Um, I'm currently professional-wise. I am a judicial administrative assistant. So I work with a judge, a Chicana judge in Washington State Court of Appeals. Um, but my personal passion passion project work um, is as an artist, um, a visual artist, but then also a jewelry maker. Um, I used to do spoken word. Um, and yeah. Um, and then I've, I met you uh, as uh, when we were both at the University of Washington. I received a master's in educational leadership and policy studies. Um, I have my undergrad in American culture studies with a concentration in diversity in higher education. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. A lot of, a lot of pockets of things. Yeah. Very versatile. <laughs> yes. Um, so I've been asking all the guest speakers, what does social justice mean to you? Or how would you define social justice? because everybody obviously has a different perspective. So my students, they know the book definition, they know their definition, they know mine, but what's yours? So for me, social justice as a woman of color, as a mujer, Chicana woman of color is something that is a day-to-day -day way of having to live, of having to think, and in terms of the choices that that I that we gotta make, you know, day in day out, um, it's in you know it could it's it's different in terms of the different settings that you're in. So in higher education, social justice for me was creating opportunities for those that didn't have them when you know let's say like when other people in my community were trying to go in um, or trying to bring in the representation needed. Um, at home, it's teaching, you know, the, my nephews, my nieces and nephews about the opportunities that are available to them, how they empower themselves, how they protect themselves um, in our community and society. Um, but I think most importantly is how we look out for our community um, in terms of their safety, in terms of their resources, um, and just making sure that we're, that we're supporting each other and bringing each other up along the way. Awesome. So what I hear a lot, and especially with what you just said is that it's like, it's, it did, it changes, right? It, mm -hmm. It's situational. Mm -hmm. So how you incorporate social justice in one sense, it's, it's everywhere. It's yes. not just at work or it's not just at home. Yep. It's in your day-to-day -day life. Awesome. So you talked a little bit about your background on, on college campuses and whatnot. What initially sparked your interest in social justice issues? So what initially sparked my interest was I think it, it stems from being a first generation um, student 
and I, and I say just student um, because I'm the youngest of six and the highest grade that my siblings or that one of my siblings got to was 10th grade. And then it goes kind of lower from there to an eighth grade um, dropout. And so we grow up hearing, or at least in, in my generation, it, was, it wasn't uncommon to, to know and to hear when your parents have a third or fourth grade or maybe even a seventh grade education. So it, so the importance of education was something that was instilled in me, you know, it's like, you're the last one, you have to make it. You got, we're gonna make this, you know, you gotta be the one. Um, so I was the first one to graduate high school. I was the first one to go into college. Um, and I say first, because since then, there's been some that have gotten their GDs or that went to technical college and things like that. Um, but what really kind of what you would say in terms of activism, it was sparked by a conference that I went to as a junior in high school. It was the Adelante con Educación Conference at the University of Washington, hosted by uh, their Mecha chapter. And that was the first time that I really saw an overwhelming representation of brown faces in a group setting period since we came up from Los Angeles. And and just just the just the the kind of just seeing the sea of faces was something that it felt weird to have it be weird that that I saw so many, you know, folks that that looked like family, that became family, um to to have conversation that was that was comfortable, that felt like home. But then also as we went into the sessions and and hearing about things that happened at home. And I mean, by that, I mean like things in, in Los Angeles back in the sixties that I didn't hear about when I lived there, let alone in a predominantly white, you know, state like Washington state. And so this kind of, there was like a bit of a hunger to learn more about my identity that really felt repressed. Um, by the educational institution or just by my teachers in general since then or, or at that point. And I started learning more about Mecha um, and learning more about how kind of our obligation or responsibility, not obligation, our responsibility that when we're given, when we are given these opportunities and these tools to empower ourselves, that it doesn't stop with us. That our responsibility is to hand it over to the next folks or hand it over, give or give that knowledge to someone else that we know hasn't gotten it either. And it could be anything from like history to scholarship opportunities to, you know, telling someone else how we were able to navigate um, the educational system or any system at like that, you know, that we're having to navigate and and it, it kind of the 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 longevity of the organization, but then also the one thing that really kind of made me want to be more committed to that work specifically with Mech as an undergrad was there's a clause in their papeles that talks about you know, the, the current students that are active are the ones that have to make the decisions. Like, I, I don't know the words, but like, verbatim. But essentially it says that the current students, you know, are facing what they're, what they're you know, making the choices, what they, what they have to make as an organization. Um, and when you graduate, your role isn't to dictate what those students do, but to maybe provide advice, um, to provide shared just knowledge itself. But everyone's experience at that point kind of is their experience at that point. And like our job as we grow and we go to the next phase of our life is to kind of face and face that next phase or kind of, you know, transition into another role itself. So it wasn't, it's not this kind of 
dictating of how things should be, but just an organic growth of the organization itself, but then also of ourselves and how we bring this out to our community too. Awesome. So that's a great story. So do you think that um, that has like shaped your current role? It has, it has. So for me, my, a lot of, so when I first went to college, my focus was, I wanted to be in theater. I was a theater nerd. Um, I like, I like doing a lot of behind the scenes work. Um, and that's kind of what I saw myself doing. Um, but I took a break my first year as an undergrad because I really wanted to take an American culture studies class. And that kind of funneled into a lot of the stuff that I, that I spoke previously. Um, but as I started learning about that, and kind of, you know, more as, as I became more active on campus, I saw that I was more passionate in being of service mm -hmm. and doing public service work. And what I did following undergrad was a lot of education-based education, education -based work. Um, I was in AmeriCorps where I worked at a middle school as a career a college and career coach um, and providing providing you know higher ed material to sixth seventh and eighth graders who you know it hadn't even crossed their minds about who, what they would do whether it be higher ed community college technical you know any type you know just just any type of post high school you know training um, or education um, I did my master's in education, and then a lot. I did a lot of work within nonprofit organizations, doing higher ed promote uh, encouragement or training and stuff. Um, but then I went to work with the city of Seattle, and I I wanted to bring in that education focus in terms of the work that the city was doing with job development and educational readiness. But one of the things that's difficult when you do public service on a local or state level is a lot of the bureaucratic barriers that happen. Mm -hmm. um, barriers or even just really kind of um governmental decisions that affect community and so i think that as i was in a position to create opportunities for um youth ages 13 to 25 you know i i was very conscious of the populations that we were serving that they were low income um pop, you know, immigrant populations uh students of color uh, or not youth of color white youth as well but they were all underserved youth and so it was very difficult to be in spaces where decisions from a city level were being made that prevented those opportunities or that prevented me from being able to to support them adequately um and so instead of me being in a position of just being the worker, you know, I had to I had to become an advocate, and I had to speak up for for people who maybe didn't even know how these decisions were affecting them because they're not in these spaces, um, a lot of closed door spaces, and making sure that they were being provided with the resources that as residents of the city that, that they were needed, but also the respect that as residents of the city that, that they're required. Um, and I ultimately had to, had to leave. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. it'd be, you know, it's, and it's, it's difficult when you, you really push yourself in a position to, to wanna be of support for your community. I think that the difficult, thing that happens, let's say like post college right now that we're talking, is when you're in those spaces where 
your advocate your the advocacy you put in also affects your mental health or your self-care right. yeah yeah Let, i was gonna say or i was gonna ask about that so sometimes our social justice core conflicts with you know our capitalist society for example right so mm -hmm. how do we navigate these spaces where we need to advance in order to make change in order to better our own careers how do you navigate that conflict or how have you navigated that conflict i think creating community is really important so creating establishing relationships with folks in in your organization um or kind of in your in you know creating a circle of support to one just being able to vent i think that's that's really difficult when you're in a position where it's just you or where you feel like you're just the only one with with these thoughts of of the coulda shoulda wouldas or how things can can be better when you're the only one that's stuck kind of having those thoughts it's it's draining and it's it, it can be a bit like physically debilitating um and so how are we able to support others when when we don't have that support when we're not able to manage kind of our own our own kind of physical space and so one of the things that helped me like right now with the example with the city is that i was you know even even with with the difficulties that that happened i was in a space that was probably the most multicultural space and you know work environment and and i was fortunate that a lot of the folks that i worked with you know saw the injustices that were happening saw you know how unfair some people were being treated or or how you know the decisions that were being made were affecting our work and so you know even just whether you find some like a, an individual that you're able to kind of lean in for support or when you interview for an environment and if it just doesn't feel right that when you're in this space it's not going to be conducive to to the work that you're that you're capable of putting out that you know you say you know what i don't think this is going to like this doesn't feel right and i don't think it'll be okay so i think the main the main important thing is creating community and creating trust um and also holding people accountable too I think that's the other thing too. When you're able to to track the work that that was promised to, so in spaces like that where where you're promising certain outcomes to your community or co your constituents, um, being able to track like how is that growth actually happening, but also holding people accountable in what you're promising your community and how you're making that that happen for others it's like a balance checks and balances right <laughs> does uh, it always so, happen no <laughs> but, and that's and it's important to talk about sometimes you know we just got to do the best that we can right yeah. with what we got um yeah. so i see you know your history of social justice and how do you this this is a two-part question so how do you use your social justice background and your experiences in your art and then how do you think or how do you see your art and your work as a form of resistance um in 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 regard to social justice so my being able to say that i'm an artist now i think it's it's a it's a it's resistance in itself just in terms of how i grew up and so and the reason why i say in terms of how i grew up is speak specifically in terms of the expectations of me so i talked about how i was the youngest of six and how education was pushed on me when i say i, I was going to be a theater major that wasn't something that was uh happily accepted by my parents and you know it was you know they they wanted me to become a lawyer or a doctor you know the 
the quintessential, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it to be in a, in a really big professional position and make all the big bucks and be financially stable. Um, so even the thought of, of doing art beyond my sketchbook was something that, that felt like I, like I couldn't do. And it was something that I didn't want to share for the longest time. Um, and so when I did do art, I gave it away. There's a lot of there's a lot of original pieces now that are that are scattered, you know, that I that I would just gift, you know, because it was so it was something that I kind of just reserved just for myself. That when it when it did go out, <clears throat> you know, it went out as as a very intimate gift, you know, for friends and family. Um, and so the so me starting art as a as part of my livelihood happened after my mom passed away. And it wasn't so much, okay, she's gone, now I can do art. Um, it was more just in paying, in paying homage to her um, because she did like the work that, that we did. And there's several artists in my family, you know, she did, she did like it, you know, she, she would have gotten a kick, you know, out of, you know, being able to see, you know, huge paintings, you know, like the one behind me. Um, but it was, you know, wanting to, you know, we talked about that self-care, like that was, that was my self-care. That was my way of, of meditating, you know, and, and being able to put whatever was on my mind, you know, on a canvas and not just a book or a journal that I, you know, would get back to every few years. Um, and it also made me go back out again with community. So where I was, you know, really big activist in undergrad, you know, for the longest time, I just kind of kept to myself. So it really brought me back out. And, you know, those, those opportunities to, to reach out to community, you know, from being in an education setting, you know, it ended up, you know, turning into networking with other, you know, business owners and other artists and creating creating those spaces for us to be able to share our work. Um, the art that I do, a lot of them is, is faces of, of mujeres, um, not specifically, not, not any like specifically, there are a few that are, that are kind of noted in terms of like a Frida face and one painting that's of my mom. Um, but it's just wanting to see faces of mujeres, you know, you know, in, in their, in all the shades and color that we come in and all the shapes, you know, I got, I got some with big cheeks, you know, and some that are lighter and, you know, some that are Afro Latinas. And so really wanting to see those faces, but then also wanting to be in, I think, also being inspired by the art that we were surrounded by in Los Angeles too. I think there's so many different murals um, that stand out from, from social justice work in Southern California that we drive by so many times and don't, you know, think twice about it. But, you know, those murals have amazing messages too and 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 that was something that was common back home that I would say home because there's home there it's home here it was something that was common home that you know it was just there but you know we we see the need for for that type of visual representation here and when you do put it out you know there's there's a resistance from others you know who end up vandalizing it whether they paint over it or whether they tear it apart you know in the public spaces um and just kind of going back and saying okay I can recreate it and we can do another one and we can sell it and we can share it and you know it can you know one one image can be spread out you know to to different parts of the states and the world too um 
another thing that, or another piece that I have, it's titled We Who Create Ourselves. And that's actually the definition of the name that I wanted to put it, which is Moyo Koyotzin. And I got that term from um, the book by Ana Castillo, uh, Borderlands. And, and it was, you know, this notion of like, we can truly create ourselves and who we want to be. Now that term is, is in connection with when she talks about Chicanismo or Chicanisma. Um, and just being able to be more than, than what is expected of us, you know, again, you know, not wanting to meet someone's expectations or growing more than what the expectation is, you know, as a Chicana woman, uh, but then also just as, as brown folks in community and society. And she actually responded to when I posted that, that image on Instagram, she gave me homework to, to read other books. I got so excited. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome wow that's good um I'm just in awe of everything that you're saying and processing still it's been a, a long journey for the both of us right through this social justice and especially right now with um, everything going on politically economically everything right and the yeah. injustices that are continuing to happen right they, they've been happening they're just very highlighted right now yep. do you think that your work is in response to a lot of things that are happening and how does how do you connect you know social issues social injustices with the passion I know you said that it's, it's like self-care and stuff like that but is I see I'll just say I see your work and I see a lot of work like with artists it's a powerful tool because they can never take that away from you, right? And so this is your like power. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, well, it's kind of a two, two part way. So when, so I'll put, I'll put the artist stuff on side first. And I'll go with, so right now with my work as a judicial assistant, that wasn't something that, that I quote unquote aspired to be, you know, just to be an assistant, you know, with, you know, having done all I did undergrad and, and grad school and stuff like that. Um, the opportunity came about because the judge that, that, I, that I applied to be an assistant was actually one of my professors in undergrad. And so she was someone who helped, you know, when we talk about like giving back, you know, she was the one to give back to me that that offered me, you know, those spaces when things became difficult in the different stages of, of my academic career at that point. And so seeing her growth as a Chicana woman from getting her law degree to being a private practice, to becoming a public defender, and then having the opportunity and, and winning the opportunity to, to be a court of appeals judge from a public defender to that position was something that in my activism work, I was like, I want to be a part of that journey too. And because even in, in the work that we do, in the decisions that are being made, especially, and the reason I say is there's a lot of decisions that are being made on the legal standpoint right now, you need to have those like-minded folks who know what's going on in our community, who know the access or lack thereof that people have to the resources when it comes to do they have proper representation where decisions made for them rightfully um, seeing documents you know there's some folks who we call them uh, pro se parties you know that defend themselves and have to submit paperwork themselves and they're submitting things that are handwritten you know, as opposed to hiring an attorney and giving them the same respect and attention 
as you know someone who's had a firm for 20 30 plus years and so my activism in that sense is you know being a representation of our community in those spaces because a lot of these spaces have judges and administrative staff that have been there for years you know and so so they're in this bubble you know you know and a lot of them you know mean well um but there's a lot of folks who are seeing and are having to face a lot of new issues um and new situations that they wouldn't experience on their day-to-day -day life and so it's how do they make new to them but not it's new to okay. them but not to us yeah, right. new to them and so you know when they're in these positions of of having to make decisions for for folks you know they really have to every everyone at some point has to be in a position where they have to step back and listen and observe and just truly process from a community standpoint but with that legal viewpoint and so just making sure that so for us, we don't make the decisions on a on a local level. You know, it's it's to see if it was made properly, and so you know we're having to, or the judges are having to see, you know, where those decisions just, you know, and when I read something, when I read opinions, I'm having to see, you know, I'm I'm seeing kind of their process, but we're also supporting up and coming attorneys and clerks, you know, who are learning about this process too. And when we hire folks, you know, keeping in mind that we want to create those opportunities because these are the people that are going to be representing, you know, folks from the state, you know, once they're done with their position. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the artwork, or just as an as an artist, it's there's there's moments when when you want to keep the work just in terms of yourself and like what or how do you say it? It's really it's really easy to want to do work that others would accept. And so what is what is popular, what is on trend, um, what is aesthetically pleasing. And so it's it's always kind of a trip to to put, you know, to put things visually that other folks wouldn't necessarily see. Um, or want to see or would say, well, that's that's not necessarily art. Mm -hmm. um so that's and that's just kind of like a, a really kind of vague kind of or, or, sorry i'm like <laughs> i'm like mixing up <laughs> i get you so it's it's easy to do something that's aesthetically pleasing and so really kind of stepping out and thinking more internally of what you want to see or what message you want to portray in, in the work right Kind of being like intentional, right? Yeah, and and, and not just um, buying into the mainstream culture, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, and, and, and in terms of 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 Chicano art, you know, I've definitely done my share of of conchas, and I I've, I've known for sarapes, especially around graduation time. Mm -hmm and set up earrings and things like that. So it's not kind of going against like what's it, what's expected to be seen, but it's also incorporating things that we, that we don't get to see on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, you know, I grew up seeing the calendars from the Mercado you know, that had the still life images of life in El Rancho or the Aztec prince, you know, holding the damsel in distress princess um, or the murals at the Mexican restaurants, you know, that we see and, you know, the señoras 
you know, grinding corn in their metate and then on the side, you know, someone's with the coman. You know, those those images of 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 culture and identity. And so how do we incorporate that? So for me, it's it's incorporating those images that kind of empowered me growing up. Um, and that also empowered me now of of that lineage that we come from, of these strong figures, you know, that we see. And so I have an image of one of my first, not the first one, I think it was the second one that I that I put, that I printed out is uh, La Corona Entrenzada. And so she has this braided crown. And for me, it's it's a, it's a literal crown. You know, we're, we're regal in that sense. Um, there's an image called La Nopalera. And that was, it's kind of a, a coy take on the the term of en nopal en la frente, you know, where, you know, it's, she's she's in the, you know, surrounded by, by cactus. And that's a representation of, of like my aunties, you know, where we, that was, that's what we harvested and that's what we grew and, and seeing my tia come down from a hill, you know, with her basket, you know, and saying, you know, have you ever had a cactus heart? And I was like, oh my God, like that sounds so poetic, a cactus heart, like what is it? And it's basically just an old cactus, you get the center, because it's tender. But you know, el corazón de, de, de no par, and I was like, ooh, I want to try that. Um, to, to making images that are an homage of, of people that have passed. So I, I recently did a painting and right now it's being displayed at, um, at an art show in Seattle. And it was an, uh, it was an homage to a lot of the, you know, the violence, you know, towards, towards Asian, you know, our Asian folks right now. And so it's, how do I say it? it's, it, it's, it's really, for me, it's, it's, it's empowering. It's, it's what, what keeps me empowered to keep myself empowered, but also I have to also keep in mind how I can empower others in the images that that others should see you know so it's it's not one one specific image or another um, but I also empower myself by seeing the work of, of other artists you know you have folks who do oil still lives and I think right now of a of one artist that that I really just kind of am drawn to his name is Adrian Delgado, um, and he's in San Jose, San Francisco, San Francisco. And he does these amazing still life oil paintings of, you know, the back of a loaded up Toyota pickup truck. You know, and it's, and it's you know, we see it and we think, you know, we don't think fine arts, when we see the image of someone, you know, loading up the recycling bin, but, you know, putting it on canvas and sharing it to the masses of folks who would probably turn their blind eye, you know, to, to something, to that type of visual in the community, you know, that's, that's, you know, shoving it in their face, like this, this can be beautiful. Or for me as, as a family of janitors, having also been a janitor, um, he has another still life um, painting of a loaded up trash bin, you know, with its cleaning bottles and things like that. And so, so that to me is beautiful too. So like, not just our visual aesthetic, but then also like what's around us and like that, that our community is beautiful, you know, in itself when we're, when we're told we're not, or when we keep, when we keep on being othered. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it's important to note because in 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 the social sciences and my main top my main um, courses are sociology. Mm -hmm. and this course incorporates some of sociology, right? It's a social sciences course. We talk a lot about how images create culture, right? Create 
our understanding of lights. So for example, when we see um, images through media, through movies, through um, television, through art like that, that's how we become socialized to see the world how we see it. So I think it's great and important to, to know that by you being intentional with this social justice lens of creating images that will impact the socialization of others, right? So by seeing this, these images, it becomes normal, right? It becomes the norm where historically our, our work has not been part of the, um, the larger mainstream kind of culture, right? So we talk a lot about um, power and privilege than oppressed and marginalized groups. So by being part of a marginalized group, you are being very intentional by creating these images to be, to, to, to like dismantle that barrier. Does I'm that gonna write sense? that answer down. <laughs> I'm gonna like, get next time someone asks me that question. Cause I'm like, yeah. yeah, right. So these are some of the things that we don't really think about, right? But as a social justice activist and scholar, that's our main goal is to break down these power barriers. So with each, with each piece, you're intentional on creating, on providing an image of things that you, like you said, we have, we don't normally see. We, you and I normally see them, but we don't normally see them in the mainstream, in the power group. Mm -hmm. So when we get into these spaces of power as a professor, as an artist, as a judicial assistant, we are taking these images with us and we're changing dominant culture. And we have a choice, right? As, as in these positions of power, we can say, we're leaving everything behind and we're just taking on this new identity or we can bring with us everything that we've learned in our, in our culture and our backgrounds and incorporate it somehow. So we're gonna pause your video right now. And then you're gonna, I'm gonna like say everything <laughs> you just said. So I sound just as smart as La Doctora. You did say it, you did say it. I just no, used, but I'm just taking everything you say and using it in social no, sciences. And it, 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 yes, yes, and it, it definitely, like, yes. Um, and the, the first thing I thought about right now that you're saying that, so, so, I, so I mentioned earlier how art as kind of a, as a living was something that was a big no-no in terms of what we could do growing up as a career. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that cracks me up at home now is when, when we, and I say we because it could be me and also my sister or my nieces and things like that, when, we're, when we have the opportunity to go to a vendor event or have things at an art show or a gallery to us, it's, 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 a, big, it's a big opportunity because it's an opportunity for others to see it, for others to share it, for, you know, you know, the pride, you know, the work that we do and, and being able to, to share space in, in community. But for my nieces and nephews, and, and, and I I've talked about this with other, with other artist friends, you know, with, with, our, with our other family members, to them it's just like, all right, well, I've already seen it. Like, you know, and it's just like, no, you guys, like this is really a big deal, but they're just, it's so part of their norm now that that's already like one generation that it's shifted, you know, in terms of, yes, I'm used to seeing like all these artist folks, you know, yeah, I know who, you know, I, I know who, who Jessica Marquez is and her work or, or yes, I know this like Brown Baker, you know, and like their work they do. Yeah, they came out in, in Netflix, like, you know, I'm cool with them, you know, so just, you know, the, the normalization, you know, for them, you know, whereas we worked hard and, and, you know, and shoved through a few narrow spaces to make it there, you know, for them, it's it's common now, you know, and, and it's 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 beautiful to see that it's weird. And then I gotta force them in to come over to see it, but like, but it's kind of to see that growth. Well, you just said right now stuck with me because you said it in the beginning, and it also stuck with me when you said it. It's weird that it's weird to see, right? And I think that's like what I'm taking from everything. I'm gonna take that. I'm gonna run with it because it is weird. 
that we are not used to seeing our culture represented in the dominant mainstream society, right? And that's a weird concept. Like you mentioned it earlier when you went to the conference around people that look like you and you realize it's weird that I feel weird right now, right? Like and I so, feel very comfortable. It's weird that I feel but comfortable. This isn't, why is this a new feeling to feel this comfort, to feel this safe? Right. Wow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that down. <laughs> I'm going to write that down. <laughs> just, to, just to wrap things up. Um, and again, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your time. Um, I'm glad that we're able to do this and we're able to document this because I know we have conversations all the time. Yeah. But I think it's important to document it and so we can share it with folks. But my students come from Torrance, California area around that. Um, Gardena, Hawthorne, Inglewood different spaces. Many are first generation, come from different marginalized communities, um, students with disabilities, students um, low income. Most of them are essential workers right now working through a pandemic and still going to school and still interested in social justice because they're all, this is all a course that they are choosing to take. What piece of advice or pieces of advice would you give to them as future social justice scholars? I think the one thing is there's, and I think in terms of, of your students and thinking back like how it was for us growing up in, in Southern California, I think when we when we keep in mind, I say it's it's hard to to forget or to not see the lack of opportunities or the fact that opportunities aren't readily available or that support varies between people. Like that's something that, that we see, that we know, um, but being conscious of that knowledge and always remembering um, the, the inequalities is what's is what helps us being able to grow beyond past that. Mm -hmm. So when we, so when people say like, oh, you're just trying to be woke about what's going on, I think it's not so much of trying to stay on trend with what's happening, but it's being consciously aware of the inequities that hold us back, um, the, the, the barriers that are in front of us, not to, to make it more difficult on us, but to be consciously aware of what we have to overcome or what we have to surpass to get to the final, you know, end goal that we want to do. So I think one is, is, is being aware of those things, but then also finding the support because there's others, there's others that are that are in our position or that have been our position, and sometimes we feel like we're the only ones that are that are that are struggling, or that are having to work, you know, three times harder. But we're not the only ones. You know, we feel like the only ones because we're in it. You know, but there's definitely a community of folks and folks that are willing to support. Um, that can show us how they were able to overcome barriers um, or that can show us at least the door, you know, that we can open up to, you know, the next chapter in our lives. Um, and if things don't happen right away, that's okay as long as you keep pushing through, you know, because everything has its time. Um, and you just gotta, how I say, it? you gotta keep in mind of the choices that you make for yourself. And what else? I'm trying to think. Try, try and be empowered. <laughs> what um, would you have liked to hear your first year of college? My first year of college. So the one thing that I did hear. Um, one, the one thing I would have liked to hear was that I had a choice in where I could live. I thought, you know, I did it. No, but I think the one thing that I heard, so I wanted to drop out 
the first weekend I was there. <laughs> so when I, you know, it was, it wasn't what I thought. I was too far from home. Um, I had gone to the campus without visiting it. So I was out in the boonies, like in the forest, by water and, you know, no Mexican restaurants or stores at that point, at least not close by. Um, and it got so bad, my anxiety of, of not wanting to be there that I ended up having to go to the, to the ER because I was hyperventilating with my panic attacks. Mm -hmm. um, and they had this one counselor come in and talk to me because they're like, all right, you know, she's just having an episode. You know, it's cool. And then he's like, so what do you, you know, what's going on? I was like, you know, I just, or like what, you know, what triggered this? You know, I was talking about that we were just about to head back to campus and I just didn't want to go, that I didn't like it. And like my roommate, I didn't know anybody, you know, there were just so many like white folks around me that didn't understand who I was and I already felt, you know, you know, just the imposter syndrome was sinking in on top of um, the microaggressions and things like that, that I had already, I was already seeing what's going to happen. I didn't want to be there. I was like, you know, I want to go to a community college or, or just work. And he's like, that's fine. You know, the other choice is fine. You know, if that's what you want. He's like, but when you applied, who decided that you should apply for college? It's like, well, I did. It's like, okay. And when you applied to that school and you got accepted, who accepted the offer? I was like, well, I did. It's like, okay, remember that. And he turned around, walked away. And in that moment, I was like, this guy didn't help me for nothing. Like, what, is, what does that even mean? But, you know, it that's what kept me going, you know, where my, you know, just even in, in filling out the financial aid form, it was something that, that I had to do on my own because my parents, again, third and seventh grade education, you know, they didn't know what that was. Um, choosing a school, my siblings didn't know what I should look. So, so I had to kind of navigate that. Um, when I ultimately chose the school that I wanted, you know, I, I looked for the community that I saw at that conference in terms of, of the, the organizations or, or the potential of, of creating, you know, these, these circles that were gonna empower me and every in every single choice I had to keep in mind this is this is a, this is your choice and this is you know and, and so so I had to you know keep on moving forward for myself I'm glad you did yeah. <laughs> and here we are <laughs> and here we are <laughs> yeah so thank you so much again um I I just really want them to see that we can incorporate social justice in anything that we choose to do, right? Whether you're an, an artist, whether you're a professor, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a lawyer, you can incorporate, you can, we can use what we're learning here and use it in, in, in any aspect, right? So whether it's community work, whether it's paid work, whether it's, you know, whatever it may be, there's always, if we are intentional about using what we learn, we can make a big difference. Yes. And I think that's what the goal of these guest lectures really are. So thank you so much. I'm looking Talk forward to seeing you. more of your artwork. And when we come back into um, in-person classes, hopefully you can come visit us. Yeah, I would like cards. <laughs> I'll bring postcards and stickers. Yeah. <laughs> we, we love stickers and postcards. <laughs> okay, thank I'll you so much. I'll probably ask for your address and I'll, and I'll send some things. Perfect. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, senorita. Talk to you later. Bye.